In our efforts for recovery, we have avoided on the one hand the theory that business should and must be taken over into an all-embracing government. We have avoided on the other hand the equally untenable theory that it is an interference with liberty to offer reasonable help when private enterprise is in need. I am not for a return to that definition of liberty under which for many years a free people were being gradually regimented into the service of a privileged few. I prefer that broader definition of liberty under which we are moving forward to greater freedom, to greater security for the average man than he has ever known before in the history of America. We shouldn't forget that Roosevelt had learned against his own upbringing to have a certain confidence and faith in working people. Roosevelt redefined liberalism in America, which was our rendition of social democracy. In the 1920s, when Roosevelt suffered the onslaught of polio, Eleanor Roosevelt became all the more liberated, you might say, to get out there, so to speak. She was coming down to New York, and she was doing a lot of work, not only with wealthy women do-gooders, but with organizers. She brought them to Hyde Park, and Roosevelt got an education. He also had had something of an education as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy in World War I. Unions had advanced during the war in shipbuilding and other areas. He learned how to deal with them to make things happen. So in the 1930s, capitalism collapsed. You've got unemployment at least at 25%. You've got farms and homesteads out here in the Midwest being shut down, auctioned off, foreclosures on people's home ownership, renters being thrown out onto the street. People were marching in the streets demanding some kind of relief. From 1929 until 1932, we see a crisis developing of truly historic proportions. And this is not only affecting the United States, but much of the world, but probably affecting the United States in a fashion that Americans had not seen since perhaps the 1890s in this country. Franklin Roosevelt said to a friend in 1931, seems to me this country needs to go radical, needs to become radical, fairly radical, for at least a generation. What he meant is that we needed to bring about radical changes. It wasn't simply a series of top-down government programs. It would not only address the needs of the unemployed by way of relief, it was also very much a program, a set of programs that would empower working people. The public infrastructure in the United States was utterly inadequate. The majority of American farmers still did not have electricity on their homesteads. So what Roosevelt did in the course of the early New Deal is he launched the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was intended to raise the living conditions of people in one of the poorest parts of the country down south, Alabama, Tennessee, that area, and harness the water for hydroelectric power in order to create factories where they could then work. So they wouldn't only be working on the public infrastructure, they would then have jobs thereafter. Roosevelt created the Civilian Conservation Corps to provide work to teenage boys and young men. This not only sent them off to fight soil erosion, which seriously once again helped rural areas, they planted three billion trees. Seedlings literally in the millions are being set out to replace trees ruthlessly destroyed. Back in the 1930s, there had developed in the Midwest and the Plain States the Dust Bowl crisis. And if you didn't address soil erosion, you were going to have an environmental crisis, which did occur, but this was to restore conditions in, in a finer fashion. He launched the Rural Electrification Agency, something which is hardly ever talked about, but really did transform rural life for so many hundreds of thousands of farmers. The big Utilities, the privately held utilities would not do that. They would not provide electricity to farmers because they figured it wouldn't be profitable enough. Power company won't do it. But I hear there's a new kind of power. 
Government. That's right. I hear there's an agency. Rural electrification. Roosevelt showed that public initiative could do it, and it worked. FDR knew there was no way you were going to make the New Deal work if you didn't have people mobilized, not just for labor, but to organize and make demands. In one speech, he said, new laws do not bring the millennium. In other words, you're going to have to fight for this stuff. National Labor Relations Act said the government would back workers. Workers themselves had to organize. They had to confront corporate bosses. They had to confront capital. Some died. Take a good look at these scenes just to refresh your memory. You have John L. Lewis, the great United Mine Workers leader, who up until this time had been a Republican. And you have Sidney Hillman, the immigrant Jewish socialist leader of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers, both left and right within labor, rallied to FDR, and they turned the Roosevelt New Deal years into a, a massive struggle to organize working people. These Southern apartheid folks had a one-party Democratic Party rule. And when you've been elected in the South, you're elected forever, which meant that they would gain seniority and they headed up the committees in Congress that would have to act on the legislation that FDR demanded. There's nothing in the FDR administration legislation that specified any kind of racialism. But the Southern Democrats in their right-wing white supremacist wisdom, what did they do? Well, they said, well, we can't legislate race, but we can legislate by occupation. So they excluded from both Social Security and the National Labor Relations Act, they literally left out capacity for agricultural workers to organize and depend on government support to enable them to do it. And in Social Security, they excluded both household workers and agricultural workers from Social Security at that time. Now, Roosevelt essentially had a choice. Do I give way on this and, and pull back the legislation? Well, there's no fucking way he was going to do that, okay? He figured we get this passed now and later we will return to the question and enlarge Social Security. We can never ensure 100% of the population against 100% of the hazards and vicissitudes of life but we have tried to frame a law which will give some measure of protection to the average citizen and to his family. A. Philip Randolph was the head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which, by the way, was not just a black union. It was a black union that had communications all over the country because these were the guys who were on the Pullman cars that were traveling the country. These guys could get off in any city they, they had to get off in and basically organize and mobilize. So in 1941, when Roosevelt gave the Four Freedoms speech, Randolph heard the speech and treated it as a moment to mobilize a march on Washington. And he decided that they were going to take to D.C., Originally, the thought was 10,000 African-Americans, and no whites were to be in the march. This was going to be self-liberation. FDR heard that, and he said, whoa, you know, he's a little worried. He wasn't worried about A. Philip Randolph and the marchers. He was worried about what whites in D.C. might do, because it was a segregated city. So he asked Eleanor, who was on really good terms with Randolph, to talk him out of bringing them to Washington. I can't help but imagine that when Eleanor went, she didn't try to dissuade him. And Randolph was pretty much convinced that once he got to the White House, which is what Roosevelt did, he invited him to the White House to talk about it, he was pretty much convinced there was no way that Roosevelt would bring him to the White House if he wasn't going to do something. And Roosevelt asked, basically, how is it true you intend to bring this march to D.C.? This is as the story's told. And Randolph says, yeah. And, wa and Roosevelt says to him, well, how many are you planning to bring? And in his head, he was expecting to hear 10, 20,000. And Randolph, knowing the theatrical moments, said 100,000. We uh, talked at length, and finally he said that, uh, well, uh, what do you want me to do? I said, we want you to issue an executive order, abolishing discrimination in munition jobs and also in the government. So he signed the executive order, 
ordering the creation of the Fair Employment Practice Commission. And basically, this was the beginning of the desegregation of the defense industries. Roosevelt dies, April 1945. Truman becomes president. Truman's first initiatives were to actually pursue what was known as the Economic Bill of Rights that Roosevelt had offered to put more meat, you might say, on the Four Freedoms. The problem is the Republicans had won control of the House and the Senate, where they could win enough with Southern votes if they needed it to make things happen. Two short years after Hiroshima, Congress dropped its own atom bomb, the Taft-Hartley Law dropped it on America's workers and their unions. Congress tried to make the Taft-Hartley law sound fair and high-minded, but don't be confused about what this law really does to you and your union. It means that ship owners, any employers, don't have to hire union members anymore. It restricts your right to strike. It cuts down the reasons for which you may pick at a plant or boss. It stops your union from taking any political action to better your living conditions or improve your working conditions. I hope that I can give up the president's wartime powers as soon as possible so that management and labor can again have the full and undivided responsibility for providing the production that we must have to safeguard our domestic economy and our leadership in international affairs. Finding the best way to accomplish that result without government directive to either labor or industry, that is your job. Adlai Stevenson running for president in 52 and 56. Talk about pseudo-liberals. Why Eleanor Roosevelt was so willing to endorse him, I have no idea. 1960, Kennedy was not a liberal. He has to be pushed in a liberal direction, and, and it was only so far that he would go anyhow. The surprise candidate, probably the most surprising figure in American history in some ways, is Lyndon Johnson. Johnson was able to enact civil rights and voting rights not only, but essentially because of the civil rights struggle, but the folks who lobbied to make possible civil rights, who made the Great Society War on Poverty at first initiatives possible, was the labor movement. He said to them, here's the list. We do this first, this first, and somewhere down the line was undo Taft-Hartley. And when they got to that moment, late 65, must have been the first filibuster he failed to break. And then McGovern led the commission that reduced the influence of labor in the Democratic Party. And then Jimmy Carter comes from a family in, out of Georgia that hated Roosevelt. So it's the Democratic Party is constantly moving, already drifting in that direction to break with the Roosevelt tradition. In the hearing before trial judge Barrington Parker, the AFL-CIO made a strong argument that President Carter exceeded his powers when he used an executive order to impose wage price guidelines. The demise of the real Democratic Party is the failure of the Democratic Party to defend labor. Let me warn you and let me warn the nation against the smooth evasion that says of course we believe these things. We believe in social security. We believe in work for the unemployed. We believe in saving homes. Cross our hearts and hope to die. We believe in all these things. But we do not like the way the present administration is doing them. Just turn them over to us. We will do all of them. We will do more of them. We will do them better. And most important of all, the doing of them will not cost anybody anything.